I've been working on quite a few different things. One of the main ones is uh, we were trying to get the warranties inside of our Ninja client um, automatically. So for all devices, um, Ninja has this nice custom features tabs where it'll go ahead and you can keep different values, everything like that inside of there. And we were trying to get the warranty start and end date inside of there. So how I kind of went about that was, let me pull that tab back up. Um, uh, yeah, that's the main workflow. It essentially just starts as a simple workflow that Ninja RMM lists devices, which sends a loop into a sub workflow. Uh, the sub workflow just kind of breaks down from there, we query Ninja for brand serial um, model, things like that, that we're gonna need inside of either the uh, cyber drain lookup, which will do it for HP, Toshiba, Toshiba, sorry about that, Dell or Lenovo devices. Um, but we actually have started to get quite a few of our devices from a manufacturer called Carbon Systems. And their API was quite a bit limiting. There was very, very, very few requests allowed, um, unless you got the other API version, which was, uh, they have it really, really locked down to big businesses only, um, which us being a relatively small MSP makes it difficult, but we still have something in the odd of, I think we're at 40 system, 40 of these systems deployed in the last couple of months. Um, so if, we go through just kind of the normal statements, the custom conditions, um, goes through, does a simple try statement of, hey, uh, what's the device manufacturer? Is it Lenovo? Is it Dell? Is it HP? Um, goes through and checks the ones for cyber drain. Um, one thing I frequently ran into was that not all devices will have the CTA, the um, system manufacturer. And whether it's because it's VMware or Ninja didn't pick it up, upright or something like that. Um, that's why that try statement had to be in there. If not, it would fail whenever it hit something where it couldn't grab that value. Because even if you have the on failure, if you have the continue always, if it tries to grab a value that is non-existent, it will, will just straight error out and stop the procedure right there. Um, so I put the try catch statement in there as false. So it'll just go past this if it's not that. And it'll always end up here um, in case it's another manufacturer or something like that. If it arrows out, it sends it over here um, on start just in case. Technically, I could remove that and just have it do it on the OEs, but I like having the on failure um, separate from different type of failures. Um, the carbon systems, which is the one I kind of dove into the most, though. Um, I have to definitely go through and add a bit more error handling to it. but this was one of the more difficult things to do on REST, and it was because it's stringing two different um, web requests together, actually, um, which I could not find a way natively to do inside of Roost. So I kind of had to um, make this initial request, request the initial page, um, and then we go ahead, we publish it as request. The next one, we go ahead, it's a post command to get the actual and to pull the serial number, the warranty information, stuff like that. We can see that inside of the body right here. Um, we also see CTX, the verification token, which is a data alias from the initial request. And it's the verification token from the earliest, the last request. And I did that instead of hard coding it for the reason of we can make multiple requests now and we don't have to worry about the verification token expiring uh, because it grabs a new one every single time. Um, once it gets to the serial lookup request though, um, there was a few cookies that it had to pull as well. Um, and I made that all pull from the initial request as well. So it's getting as much up-to-date info as possible. We won't have to worry about expirations on cookies or anything like that. Um, one really weird thing I would like to kind of give a general heads up about web requests too. Um, weirdly enough, content type is required at least in this request. 
Um, the second you wouldn't put any content type or something like that, it would actually give you a 400, um, something along the lines of access denied error. Um, but once you actually put the content type of application URL encoded, um, it was able to make the request and put through and everything uh, perfectly fine. And then we can see the results from that. Uh, just ran today. We have something to the extent of, I'm going to say it's 1,800 machines. Let me double check that. Devices, 15, about 1,500 machines. Um, so it was definitely a lot easier to do automated than it was manually. Um, it went through something like 10,639 steps, it looks like. Um, and for the most part, the carbon systems where it does the web requests and everything like that, we didn't have any errors out regarding um, timeout times or anything. Um, I'm implementing something on the request side, the web request side though, that if it fails, it'll retry up to three times and then proceed to failure upon there. Um, and that's just in case, you know, the amount of web requests that fail are, it's kind of a crapshoot on whether it's going to fail or not. So it's definitely better to put those three tries in there.